From our studio at the corner of 8th and Walton in Bentonville, Arkansas, welcome to Saturday Morning Meeting, where we cover Walmart, Sam's Club, and the consumer product companies that are represented on their racks and shelves throughout the country and around the world. I'm Derek Ridenour, and our focus is on the insights, trends, and best practices that will help you as a supplier manage and grow your business with the world's largest retailer. And coming up today, we're going to be talking with Fernando Salido. He's the Vice President of Consumer and Shopper Marketing with IRI. But first, your headlines. The big news this week was Walmart's second quarter figures. Walmart reported an unexpected decline in quarterly same-store sales in the U.S. after shoppers came in less often because higher taxes and gas prices left them with less spending money. Wall Street analysts were expecting a 1% gain, but instead U.S. sales at the company's main Walmart chain declined three-tenths of a percent at stores open at least one year. Now, because net sales in the first six months were below expectations, Walmart updated its forecast for net sales to grow between 2 and 3 percent for the full year versus its previous range of 5 to 6 percent. Charles Hawley, executive VP and CFO, said, quote, the retail environment remains challenging in the U.S. and our international markets as customers are cautious in their spending. This revision reflects our view of current global business trends and significant ongoing headwinds from anticipated currency exchange rate fluctuations, end quote. For the third quarter, Walmart U.S. expects comp sales to be relatively flat, and Sam's Club expects comp sales, excluding fuel, to be between flat and 2 percent. Walmart did report second quarter diluted earnings per share of $1.24, a 5.1 percent increase compared to last year's $1.18. Another hot topic this week was the Amazon-Walmart war. 24-7 Wall Street said Walmart's threat to Amazon should not be underestimated. Yes, in June, Walmart had 40 million unique visitors, while Amazon had 98 million. But Walmart continues to press for its customers to shop more online. It has the leverage of its brands and a management prepared to do almost anything to hurt Amazon's success online. Retail Wire, after charting a side-by-side -side comparison of those giants, noted two interesting ideas. First, Walmart has the biggest foundation in the history of retailing already built. Second, Walmart makes money and a lot of it, while Amazon had negative net income for at least the past year. From Atlanta Magazine's Daily Agenda, Walmart made history this week by opening the world's smallest Walmart, around 2,500 square feet near Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Dubbed Walmart on campus, it offers everything from ink jets to ice cream to shampoo to cold cuts. It even has a greeter at the door. Northwest Arkansas was in the news this week as well. CNN Money reported that Northwest Arkansas is a hotbed for startups. This because of Arkansas's tax credits for startups and training and mentorship that's available here and the area's number of top-notch executives, some of whom start their own companies. And Forbes magazine this week ranked 200 metropolitan areas in its list of best places for business and careers. Central Arkansas ranked number 32 and Northwest Arkansas ranked number 28 in the country. Coming up next, we're going to talk with Keith Anderson from the Retail Net Group to talk more about Walmart's numbers. And later, Fernando Salido with IRI will join us. Today's show has been sponsored in part by 8th and Walton, the premier destination for Walmart supplier education. 8th and Walton offers a variety of services including new supplier onboarding, scorecard optimization, and analysis and reporting. Visit 8thandwalton.com forward slash services to learn more. GigWalk is an on-demand mobile workforce that can collect data and do work at retail. Businesses use GigWalk for retail audits, merchandising, and much more. With 350,000 smartphone-enabled workers available on demand, you get unprecedented speed and coverage across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And all work is reviewed for quality and accuracy. Visit GigWalk.com to learn more. Welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting. Walmart just released their uh, second quarter numbers and not really so favorable for Walmart. Joining me now is Keith Anderson from Retail Net Group. Keith, thank you for joining us. Bad numbers, a lot of people acting surprised. Should they be surprised by this? Well, I think people are surprised because there's the perception that the economy is recovering, and in many ways it is, but truthfully, whenever I look at Walmart's 
with results. The big question to me is how much are the results a reflection of Walmart's strategy and execution and how much are the result of the state of the U.S. consumer? And I think when you look at the rate of job growth and the relationship between wage growth and inflation, it, it isn't necessarily surprising to me as an observer that Walmart and the U.S. consumer remain under a lot of pressure. Uh, I do think Walmart is, as always, really focused on managing what can be managed. And so there's a lot to suggest. They're tweaking their model and their execution to try and accelerate recovery in their results. Uh, but I, I don't think anyone should truly be surprised. Uh, you know, there are some real structural challenges that I think are going to remain with us. And, uh, and, and for that reason, I wasn't particularly surprised. Well, does, I mean, Walmart's kind of said, you know, we had a, a very cool summer and they, they've thrown out some things. But is this, doesn't they ha don't they have some culpability in this uh, in terms of their excessive out of stocks? I mean, I was just talking to somebody uh, this week who was in some stores um, in the Dallas area and said the out of stocks were unlike he had, anything he had ever seen. Uh, and where they did have stock, they had kind of a lack of supervision and some people in the stores to actually execute that. So it, doesn't Walmart shoulder some of this responsibility and blame? I, I think there are issues like the, the issues with stockouts and some of the pressure on, on uh, in-store labor that are well-known. Uh, but when I look at the quarter's results, consolidated inventories actually grew faster than sales. And so that's not a positive trend, but it suggests that as they have been for many quarters, Walmart has been adding back SKUs. Uh, they, are, they are trying to do a better job of adjusting inventories and forecasting and replenishing so that they minimize out of stocks. But you know, there, there is no question that they'll be focused on really minimizing those missed opportunities. Uh, I think the, the real challenge they face is one that they may be culpable for, but not something that can be managed month to month or quarter to quarter. And, and that is, when you look at what drove the comp decline in the U.S., despite being able to increase ticket by 0.2%, traffic declined by half a percent and so the for that ongoing traffic decline trip consolidation across all channels the seasonally high fuel costs uh, but but maybe most importantly it's the location of their real estate and correcting that issue is something that is going to take a long time to correct uh, so we, we see the expansion of the express formats in the neighborhood market, but getting those stores to maturity and really ramping up is going to take three years or five years. And so uh, I, I think the real emphasis between Walmart and their vendors on really better forecasting and replenishment and making sure that stock that's in the back room gets to the sales floor is essential, but I, I think there are some longer term things at play here that are going to be really important to execute. So what do you think drove these, these less than expected results? Well, I really think it was the, the decline in traffic. Uh, you know, the, the reality is uh, execution, merchandising, or in-store marketing that will save you if you're not winning the, the trip and you don't get the foot traffic that you need. And I think from a competitive point of view, uh, especially during summers when fuel prices tend to be higher, there are a lot of households, uh, especially among some of Walmart's core and most loyal uh, shopper base, who are shopping on the paycheck cycle, may or may not be receiving some form of government assistance. And to them, uh, a, a trip to a smaller building closer to where they live or work at least during these periods of seasonally high expenses, uh, may, be, may be the preferable option. And so I think Walmart has to really find ways to capture as many trips with their current footprint as possible, but I definitely expect you to see them continue to accelerate the rollout of some of the formats that give them a footprint closer to where people live and work uh, so that they can really turn turn around the trend of the 
declining traffic. Okay, so we're halfway through the year. Got two quarters left uh, before end of year results. What do you think Walmart does to turn this around? Uh, I, I think at the highest level, anything they can do to trigger trips is going to be a very big deal. I, I think uh, one thing that they were disappointed by in the second quarter was lower than expected uh, performance during some of the key seasons. And so to me, while this isn't really news, the fourth quarter and holiday is fundamentally going to be probably the highest pressure period of the rest of the year for Walmart. And so I think they've really demonstrated great leadership on price and value communication in years past. But I think that's only going to intensify this year because the pressure to make full year numbers is really intensifying as a result of the, the sort of bumpy last couple quarters. So I think seasonal is going to be a very big deal. I think that you'll probably see continued escalation of uh, communicating price and value, especially at the local level. And, and thirdly, I do think you'll continue to see huge emphasis on uh, really optimizing inventory management so that where possible we can minimize these stock out issues that, that have plagued us for a few quarters. Keith Anderson with Retail Net Group, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. And we're going to be right back with Fernando Salida with IRI. He's going to tell us some key things that IRI can help you with in your business. Cameron Smith & Associates is supplier's first choice in recruiting the competitive Walmart supplier job market. We connect qualified candidates to CPG jobs in Northwest Arkansas and across the country. CSA also sources sales and marketing professionals for companies providing advertising, marketing, merchandising, and data management services to suppliers. Contact us today at csarecruiters.com. And welcome back. We are talking now with Fernando Salido. He is the IRI Vice President and Team Lead for the Walmart account here. Welcome. Uh, Information Resources Incorporated, better known as IRI, does a lot of a lot of different things. Most, um, I guess, for, for most of us who are in the supplier side, it's all about getting those IRI numbers that look very positive for our items. But you do a lot of other things too. Let's talk about what IRI does. Uh, thanks, Derek, for having us today. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm with IRI, and IRI has been in syndicated information for the past 30 years. It's best known for its market performance information, getting a broad understanding of retail performance across the U.S. and globally. Uh, but IRI does many other things for um, its suppliers and retail community. And I'm here in Northwest Arkansas to help uh, Walmart and uh, the NWA suppliers really uh, improve collaboration and successfully accelerate Walmart's growth. What we do beyond the traditional sort of syndicated market performance information is do a lot of work in the area of shopper insights and shopper marketing. Uh, we have a very broad uh, best practice in the area of shopper insights, marketing activation, uh, targeting programs that we do with Walmart as well as with other retailers to help really engage and activate the shopper and drive more traffic and conversion to Walmart. Thirdly, we do a lot of work in the area of analytics. So both with suppliers and uh, with retailers where we will do things like uh, trade promotion effectiveness, marketing mix, uh, improving uh, item optimization and assortment in store. Uh, there, you know, we, we look at analytics as just another major untapped area for growth and Walmart is are really engaged in this area too because as they're not only accelerating their organic growth uh, with their sort of tra traditional 4P means, they're also looking at analytics as another competitive advantage which we uh, are participating in. And lastly, another broad area for us is our consulting practice. We do a lot of C-suite level consulting practice, mm -hmm. uh, everything from uh, mergers and acquisitions to just very broad level um, total uh, company um, consulting projects. So those are the four primary areas. And just to summarize that, market performance, consumer and shopper marketing, analytics, and consulting. And you did a lot of training here. In fact, uh, just yesterday, I know you guys were teaching, had a big class at your office here 
um, across from the home office. Um, can any anybody sign up for those classes? So we have a number of different types of training programs. The the training program that you saw yesterday happened to be with a supplier of one of our consumer and shopper marketing solutions, a solution actually designed for Walmart in use by Walmart. And this supplier is using this program as a means to gain um, thought leadership at Walmart by really understanding what's happening with the Walmart shopper. So the training program you saw yesterday was specifically supporting one of our solutions. However, we do a lot of training uh, in, in basics, uh, what we would call category management 101, 201, 301. In fact, IRI provides an entire category management certification program uh, from uh, nuts to bolts, truly end to end, where it would cover everything from understanding point of sale information to understanding panel information, which is a national consumer panel of 100,000 shoppers and really understanding how to bring all of this information plus information like retail link and primary research, competitive uh, intelligence into an integrated understanding of improved category management at Walmart. Uh, we not only make those classes available through IRI itself, but we're also partnering with Ethan Walton to bring some of those classes uh, to the Northwest Arkansas community. Okay. One of the questions that I get that I've heard a lot, uh, and I've had the question myself, um, if for the smaller suppliers or regional suppliers who certainly are not the PNGs or the crafts or the Unilever's, um, if they don't have the resources, and particularly the small companies, we had TJ Fultz in from Humankind Water, obviously has no money to go buy RI data, um, but w what can you do to help a supplier like that? Or is there anything you can do to help a supplier like that who is, who is small or regional, may not have the assets to afford to buy a subscription to IRI, but they have to have those IRI numbers to even begin to tell a story with a Walmart or a Target or a Kroger or Publix or whoever. How can you help them or can you help them? Yes, we actually have a very, very large, um, what we would call sort of mid-tier market programs. There are thousands of companies, as you mentioned, and they're all vying to essentially uh, build their business with retailers, including Walmart. And what we do is provide a lot of consulting services, ad hoc services, meaning you don't have to be a large subscriber or a large company that subscribes to our solutions, which that's kind of the traditional model where you, as a large company, would have 24-7 access to our solutions and maybe a, a, a large consulting army of IRI people supporting them. We actually do have practices at IRI designed for smaller companies precisely to help them gain a competitive advantage with retailers. So if they're looking for point of sale information, if they're looking for shopper information, if they're looking for special projects, be it a survey of our national consumer panel, uh, an understanding of different consumer and shopper segments, um, any type of information that they might need where we have special practice in, we can help them on a one-time basis on a consulting project uh, and even sort of what we would call pay by the drink, meaning you purchase one or two reports that you need for an upcoming meeting. But we have actually been doing a lot of that work here as well in, North, in uh, Northwest Arkansas, uh, deliberately trying to help uh, maybe equalize the playing field or at least give a competitive advantage for smaller players. And often we don't get a lot of lead time. Maybe it's a week or two and it's really helped smaller clients improve some of their business outcomes at Walmart. When Retail Inc. launched several years ago, decades ago, uh, it was really kind of revolutionary. And in, in fact, you could pull POS data back from yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, Walmart obviously now buying IRI data. What What's changed? Because the POS data is not kind of the, the, the big deal that it used to be. A lot of things have changed. Walmart's using IRI data a little differently, not just looking at POS. How, how are some of the ways that they're using it? Sure. Uh, as you mentioned, it's probably been now more than 12 months since Walmart started to participate again in releasing their own uh, information to uh, both Nielsen and IRI in terms of getting a full understanding of what's happening in the retail landscape. Uh, so. Walmart is heavily invested in, in point of sale, truly trying to understand what is happening, not only 
within uh, their own understanding that they used, traditionally got through Retail Link, but truly understanding what's happening in rest of market. Both Nielsen and IRI received the same information from a point of sales perspective, and both Nielsen and IRI include that, um, that information into the broader uh, point of sale information that we provide to our clients so that our clients have a full view of the market. So uh, Walmart has um, you know, said that we have equal access and acceptance of data from either partner. Where we are a little bit different, uh, differentiated from Nielsen would be, is that we're really working with Walmart in the area of shopper, shopper insights, and understanding what is what is really happening to the you know, underlying shopper behavior. We call shopper the why behind the buy. POS is going to tell you more about the what, more about um, the four P's, pricing and promotion activity in the market, assortment opportunities in the market. But to understand the root cause behind uh, market performance, which you capture through point of sale, you really need to understand what's happening with the shopper. Where is traffic going? Uh, where are they converting? How much leakage are retailers experiencing when um, a competitor maybe has a you know, promotional activity, et cetera? So we look at shopper as truly kind of the underlying reason for the market performance that you traditionally see in POS. And that's where we are particularly working with, uh, with Walmart to truly deliver new insights above and beyond point of sale. How is IRI impacting the uh, club channel? Because Sam's obviously is participating in this, just like Walmart. Costco, yes. I, I'm not sure if they are or not. I would assume that they are, but, but they're kind of quiet. And So my point is there are two club channels, Costco and Sam's. Yes. What are you seeing in that area? Okay. Uh, well, first, uh, Costco is actually exclusively partnered with IRI, um, where Costco has a retail portal that um, they only deliver through IRI and, and to clients. So it's it's purposely not included in rest of market view per our you know contract with Costco, if you will. With Sam's Club uh, and the way we're organized uh, in Bentonville, our IRI team. We, we actually have on-site teams supporting Walmart, uh, supporting GCIA, and supporting Sam's Club itself. Uh, Sam's Club, as we know, operates separately from Walmart, and we do maintain separation of the teams, um, just as you would maintain separation of Walmart and Sam's in terms of any opportunities or planning work that they're doing. We do try to share best practices with our Sam's team, and the way we're working with Sam's today is uh, we're in the early stages of essentially um, uh, integrating Sam's point of view about the world, the way they look at it, what their geographies look like, mm -hmm. what their product hierarchy looks like, and working with them on projects to try to help improve, similarly to Walmart, uh, their shopper traffic, their shopper conversion. And, uh, but, but we're working with them both in terms of POS and shopper information. Uh, we're a little bit further along with Walmart, just because we've had more presence at Walmart for a longer period of time. But we are also working equally with Sam's and working on a number of projects to help them accelerate their organic growth. Where do you see the real growth for, um, in terms of, of what Walmart needs to do? Because uh, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. And the, the specific customer, Walmart struggled with the millennials. Um, and second quarter earnings obviously weren't flattering for Walmart. One of the things that I know we had discussed were trips. Let's talk a little bit about the trips and who that, uh, or how Walmart should go after the millennials. And use, uh, we also talked yesterday about the aging baby boomers. Yeah, and higher income. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned uh, yesterday, and I, I've, act, I've been tracking uh, Walmart's business for quite some, quite some time now. And what's been interesting to me is how highly correlated traffic is to Comstore growth. So you can take two separate pieces of data, uh, the way Walmart reports its Comstore growth during its earning calls, and look at traffic that we capture through National Consumer Panel and see a high correlation between that performance and what is happening with trips. Um, I broke this down yesterday for you, but the way I think about comp growth, it has three components. You can get comp growth from pricing, from optimizing your assortment or from traffic. When you're Walmart and you're focused on everyday low pricing, that means that 
by definition, you're kind of keeping your prices low, so that's not going to be a major driver right. of comp growth. Assortment provides tremendous opportunity, low-hanging fruit, frankly. If you get the right products in the right stores, it should drive greater traffic, more conversion, higher velocity. But thirdly, and most importantly, when you've done everything you can with pricing, and you're sort of bringing those prices down if you're Walmart, you've optimized your assortment. That means that you have traffic left as your primary driver of comp growth. That means that you need to understand which shoppers to attract, how to bring them into your stores and convert them. And as you and I discussed yesterday, we study the Walmart shopper intensely every day. And we look for the opportunities that Walmart might have in the long run to improve its traffic and conversion. And there are at least two key areas that we see where Walmart could uh, improve its, its traffic and conversion. One, as you mentioned, is the millennials. Um, you know, baby boomers were uh, the largest population boom that the U.S. had ever seen, and there was about 80 million boomers. Generation X, there's only 40 million of them, essentially, and they're called the sandwich generation, supporting Gen Y as well as maybe the aging boomers. But the boomers are by far the largest population spurt that the U.S. has ever seen. And those millennials, uh, those millennials born after 1980, represent tremendous opportunity for Walmart. And they are the future new homes. They are the future starting households that today don't have kids. Today they're under 40, but they represent the greatest opportunity to win, start building loyalty today for the long run. And there is great opportunity for Walmart to figure out how to tap into um, those, those uh, millennials and win them over for the long run. But that does mean having a different type of assortment, different type of attraction and store experience. Uh, and I think that Walmart is positioning itself to attract those millennials in the longer run with walmart.com, with smaller store formats that might mm -hmm. be more focused on convenience and smaller shopping trips. I think that represents an opportunity. The second large group that I think Walmart could really better understand today is um, higher income shoppers. Um, we have seen kind of a tale of two shoppers and this is kind of you know public news in the, in, in the sense that the Walmart core shopper who makes less than $70,000 a year uh, to for all intents and purposes only has so much money to spend at Walmart. Um, it's those who make over $70,000 a year that represents an opportunity to Walmart if Walmart could figure out a way without becoming Target or going back to right. previous um, exper experiments, if you will, <laughs> but trying to figure out truly how to tap into these higher income shoppers. And from the studies that we have done, we do see higher income shoppers go to Walmart, but for very specific reasons. In fact, as they go up the income scale, we see more focus on consumable products like beauty products or gift giving occasions. Um, in fact, if you're making over six figures, uh, oftentimes one of the you're disproportionately spending on greeting cards at Walmart. It's a driver to the store. Uh, whereas if you're lower income, you might be more focused on retirees, for instance, who might be buying single frozen meals. So very different needs for different income groups, but I think that there are ways to tap into those different shopper segments by communicating with them differently. We talk about, uh, traditionally you've heard the term shopper path to purchase. We don't really talk about path to purchase anymore as much as we talk about touch points. What are all the touch points by which you can either speak to millennials or speak to higher income shoppers or your current core Walmart shoppers? Those touch points come in the form of .com, they come in the form of mobile, they come in the form of traditional media as well as still in-store experiences and in the aisle. So there isn't just a straight path to conversion anymore, but there are many touch points at which Walmart needs to win every step of the way. Um, let's say I'm a brand new supplier to Walmart. Went through everything, got my supplier agreement and I'm ready to go. What are some things that um, I need to get in terms of marketing data and what can you help me with? As a new Walmart supplier, I think you'd want to understand um, just very briefly sort of the what, why, and how. 
uh, the what would be more of what is happening with your with the category that you're participating in um, is performance up or down is Walmart gaining share uh, who is your competition um, if, if you're trying to what differentiates you from your your competition or how do you feel that your products are going to help Walmart optimize its assortment? So there's a lot to understand in terms of landscape. That's kind of the what. The why uh, is a combination of understanding uh, some insights. What are the key insights and opportunities? Meaning, uh, now you've set the stage on uh, where to play. You've kind of defined your category and how it's performing. The why is going to understand help you understand how to win. Uh, what is happening with shopper behavior? What is happening with, um, with uh, shopper trends? What are they, what are they uh, converting into? What, are they, what have you seen longitudinally over time? What are shoppers starting to go uh, towards? We, I mentioned before that I see trips as a leading indicator. Mm -hmm. um, you can start to look at traffic today and conversion against new products and start to see trialed and repeat purchases. And that can give you an understanding of what new products today might actually be gaining ground. And as you think about your own products as a new supplier, what can you offer that uh, would help create that buzz, that traffic, that conversion, that over time would help you perhaps gain greater um, distribution at Walmart. But it comes in the form of, of being able to tell your merchant, why is this important to Walmart? Who is the shopper? What is the opportunity for growth for Walmart? And can you quantify that? And so you start to set the stage not only understanding the what, the why, and then the how to me is really um, what kind of activation or, or shopper activation plan can you bring to Walmart in order to ensure that your products are succeeding at Walmart? So you've set the stage on the category, you've kind of defined some key insights and opportunities, and right. the, now you're saying, how can I actually activate um, this growth at Walmart? How can I accelerate growth by bringing together a true uh, shopper activation plan? And again, I say it's around shopper activation because at the end of the day, you're trying to um, reach all those touch points with shoppers. You're trying to uh, lure them into Walmart and you're trying to convert them at the shelf. So it really is about building a shopper activation plan, in my opinion. And what keeps you up at night? Um, what keeps me up at night is uh, really thinking about how Walmart, in with its current uh, portfolio of stores in the U.S. and its current model, can really help, in fact, draw new consumers and shoppers to its stores. The world is changing very rapidly. The retail landscape has been changing just dramatically, and, and Walmart has just been a tremendous leader in that space, but their competition is also very nimble. They're very tough. Uh, they're very innovative. Uh, and oftentimes, it's hard to tell where Walmart, uh, even as an expert, where Walmart should focus, right? Should they focus on uh, dollar stores? Should they focus on traditional grocery right. stores? Should they focus on dot com? And the fact is they have to focus on all of them uh, for different reasons to some extent. So what keeps me up at night is really thinking about how can we help Walmart accelerate its organic growth by driving more traffic, shopper conversion, and ultimately comp growth um, for from you know for a long time to come. Okay, and if I want more training, I can call you, call your office. Absolutely, uh, you're you're uh, welcome to do a few things. You can go to iri.com to get information broadly about our um, solutions, but you're welcome to call me. Uh, my number is 479-268-7105. And we want to thank Fernando Salido for joining us. Hopefully you've gained some insight as to what IRI may be able to do to help your company. Also, we'd like to hear from you. Email us Saturday at ethanwalton.com with your questions, suggestions, or feedback, or a topic that you may want to hear discussed here. And again, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next Saturday morning.